late April, I got a letter in the mail from Randolph Franklin Dial. If you believe Dial's telling the truth, the contents of the letter reveal the answer to the key question in the case. Did Bobby Parker leave willingly? Six pages written in the hand of a mastermind. A minute-by-minute -minute account of the day Randolph Franklin Dial escaped from the Oklahoma State Reformatory and took the warden's wife, Bobby Parker, with him. It is one of the most puzzling cases investigators have ever worked. How could Bobby Parker have been snatched from her home against her will? How could she allow herself to be taken off prison grounds, leaving behind her husband and their two young daughters? For months, we have been trying to get into the Oklahoma State Penitentiary to talk with Randolph Dial on camera. The Department of Corrections has always denied our requests, but for the first time, I was allowed on prison grounds to talk with Randolph Dial in person. The staff was polite, and courteous, professional, but because of policy, I'm not allowed to talk about the contents of our conversation. I was approved as a pen pal visitor, not as a journalist for News Channel 4. However, the letters written in Randolph Dial's own hand are fair game. Dial's account begins four days before the escape. On Friday, August 26th, I overheard Bobby. She and Randy were going to the annual prison rodeo at McAllister. The final plans for my escape had already been made. I decided to drug her with Valium, take her hostage, and escape at the earliest and best opportunity. In the next four days, Dial would gather up some essentials, $900 in savings buried in the Parker's front yard, toiletries stolen from the Parker's bathroom, and the drugs, Valium, Yellow Jackets, and Darvon. At about 7.45 on the morning of August 30th, as I was watering the two rows of flowers which ran along each side of the sidewalk in the Parker front yard, Randy and Bobby stepped through the front door and onto the porch. I walked away to give them privacy, but was able to hear Bobby tell the deputy that she expected to be gone most of the day and wouldn't return from Altus until late afternoon or early evening. Perfect. One hour later, Dial says he struck up a conversation and offered Bobby a glass of Dr. Tea. By the time she'd finished her second glass of tea, I detected a slight slurring of some of her words. Dial asked for a ride back to his housing unit in the Parker's family van. As she backed out of the driveway onto the street, I quickly slid down into the bottom of the van and put a regular black comb, edge first, against her ankle just above her sock. I said, don't look down here and don't stop. I saw her hand fly to her mouth. I pressed the edge of the comb against her ankle. Be quiet, I said back, adding, don't start crying. Don't screw this up, Randy. I've got a straight-edge razor down here, and I don't want to hurt you. Bobby Parker drove off prison grounds with a convicted murderer in her passenger floorboard. When are you going to turn me loose? She asked the question, blowing her nose and glancing down at me. I told her the truth. I don't know yet. I just want to feel safe. When I feel safe, I'll let you go. I just don't want any problems, that's all. No problems. She looked down at me. You've already got a problem, Mr. Dial. Oh, yeah? What? She didn't hesitate to answer. I've wet my pants. That was the beginning of a journey that would last 11 years, more than a decade on the run. Investigators discovered Randolph Dial and Bobby Parker living in filth on a chicken farm in East Texas. She was reunited with her family. He went straight back to prison. They haven't spoken since. Bobby, I'm more sorry than I can even say about the unhappiness I caused you and your children, parents, brothers, and friends. All I can say in my defense is that in my own way, I loved you then and now with a love I'll take to my grave. I can only pray to the God we both believe in that I'll take your forgiveness as well.